Okay. Uh, so last time we were discussing how linear regression is associated with correlation. So as what I've said previously, when we talk about correlation, one of the limitations of correlation is that it's a bit difficult to use it to test hypothesis because correlation analysis inherently does not make us specify which is the independent variable and which is the dependent variable. And so if our intention is to test hypothesis involving predictions uh, wherein we hypothesize that one particular predictor influences or has an impact or can predict another another variable, then correlation is not enough um, as a method of analysis. And what we should do is that we should run uh, linear regression as a follow-up to correlation. So in practice, as what I've told you, research papers that make use of linear regression or multiple linear regression as their primary means to test the hypothesis, uh, conventionally we present first correlation analysis. So that makes correlation analysis some kind of a preliminary um, statistical analysis prior to conducting um, regression. And how are the two related with one another? So one, as is mentioned in the slides, both are interested in the relationship between two variables. And particularly, we use correlation and regression when the two variables are measured as a continuous variable. So if we have two variables and these two variables are hypothesized to have a relationship and both these variables are measured as a continuous variable, then those are the times wherein we use correlation, particularly Pearson R correlation. And similarly, this is also the condition wherein you can use linear regression. Although, as what we have pointed out, it's also possible that one of the variables, particularly the IV in the case of regression, uh, be a uh, dichotomous variable. Although, of course, when the variable is dichotomous, logically we'd think that t-test no, can be preferred over linear regression. But linear regression is also another option. So this is uh, also um, an option. Although, again, more often than not, and of course this will depend on the objective of the study, more often than not, when we have a dichotomous variable, we should use t-test. Not unless, for example, you're running not simply a linear regression but multiple regression and you have multiple predictor variables um, instead of just having one predictor variable. So this happens to be another predictor variable which is also hypothesized to have an influence on the dependent variable. And you want to test the model as a whole then even if this is dichotomous, you don't have to run a separate t-test and then a separate linear regression. You can test the entire model using multiple regression. But we're not talking about multiple regression yet. We'll park that for the meantime. Um, I'm just discussing one of the possibilities when you might consider using regression even if your independent variable is measured as a dichotomous variable. We have also said that um, linear regression is uh, used when we have pairs of scores from coming from the same participant or matched participant. So for example, uh, our example previously is our independent variable is pandemic anxiety and our dependent variable is quality of sleep. So if these were to be our IV and VV, and if these two variables were measured on the same set of participants, for example, all of, our, all of us are participants in the study, and each one of us were measured in terms of our level of pandemic anxiety and our quality of sleep, uh, and therefore each of us have a pair of scores, our score with pandemic anxiety and our score with, uh, in terms of quality of sleep, you know, then that kind of pairing is what we refer to when we say 
paired scores taken from the same subjects. And in some rare occasions, the two variables can also come from two separate samples. When we say that the pairs of scores can also come from matched subjects, it, it's also possible that um, the two variables that are involved in our hypothesis um, may be measured uh, from two separate individuals if the conceptualization dictates that the two variables that we are correlating really in real life are attributes of two separate individuals. For example, you might be interested in transformative leadership. I don't exactly know how to explain what transformative leadership is. It's some kind of good leadership. And let's say, for example, that you want to know if transformative leadership can predict motivation of employees. So there are two ways by which we can collect data if this is our hypothesis. Um, it might be that the two variables can be measured uh, from the same participants. For example, all of us are employees. However, if we're employees, then we really cannot speak about the leadership in our division. Leadership is an attribute of, of course, in the context of our company department, leadership is an attribute of our leaders, not the subordinates. But if transformative leadership is operationalized as, let's say, for example, perceived, perceived transformational leadership, meaning to say, the transformational leadership of our leaders based on the perspective or as observed by the employees, uh, then that might be possible. And then, of course, motivation, because it is our motivation that is being measured, then we can uh, report our own level of motivation. So perceived transformational leadership, how do we perceive our leaders in terms of transformative leadership? Motivation, we, we ourselves can report about that as well. So both of these variables, their measurements in that scenario that I'm trying to explain come from the same subject. But it's also possible that I can collect these two data sets or measures of these two variables from separate individuals. And that is if we sort of remove this perceived leadership and we go directly to our superior and we ask our superior to um, answer a certain questionnaire and supposedly this questionnaire will reveal his or her um, transformative leadership. And then uh, the researcher can also measure the employee's motivation. If hypothetically we are able to collect, let's say for example, 100 employees and each of these 100 employees have different supervisors, then uh, we still have pairs of scores, how the supervisor reports about his behavior, which will supposedly measure transformational leadership and their respective employees' level of motivation. So we still have pairs of scores, but this time they don't come from the same subject. They come from matched subjects. And the matching is uh, there is a match between uh, the employee and the, and the supervisor. Um, so that is also a possibility. Although more often than not, it is the case of this that we normally encounter. Um, correlation is concerned with uh, magnitude and direction of the relationship and that is something that we have discussed in previous topics. The measure of the, the relationship between two variables when we're running correlation is via a correlation coefficient and the correlation coefficient is a value that can run from negative one to positive one and uh, this value supposedly represent two things. One is the magnitude. And when we talk about the magnitude, um, the primary indicator of that would be the value of the coefficient, regardless if it's positive or negative. The higher the value, the higher the magnitude. And the other one is direction. 
uh, which we get information from the sign of the coefficient. So if it's negative, therefore, there is a negative relationship. We need to save a increase in one variable coincides with the decrease of the other variable and vice versa. Or it might be positive. So if the sign is positive, then that indicates a positive relationship. And a positive relationship is when the increase in one variable also coincides or goes along with the increase in the other variable and um, vice versa. And to some extent, linear regression can also speak about magnitude and direction. So in correlation, we have what we call as correlation coefficient. In regression, the counterpart to that is what we call as regression coefficient. And in regression coefficient, there are two actually. There is the unstandardized and the standardized regression coefficients. Now between the two, both unstandardized and standardized regression coefficients also talk about direction uh, because regression coefficients likewise also have signs, so positive or negative. Based on that, that could give us information as to whether the predictive relationship is positive or negative, uh, which is exactly the same interpretation you'd have if you're talking about correlation coefficient. Magnitude, however, magnitude when it comes to regression coefficient, we'd have a better feel of that if we talk about standardized regression coefficients. The correlation coefficients that we normally talk about are standardized values as well. If you want to talk about um, the kind of regression coefficient wherein we can talk about magnitude, then that specifically can be derived from what we call as a standardized regression coefficient. And the standardized regression coefficient is also referred to as beta. And all of these things we will talk about when we demonstrate regression. Great. So my point is that um, although in the slide it says that correlation is concerned with magnitude and direction of the relationship, that doesn't mean to say that regression coefficients or linear regression does not say anything about magnitude and direction. It also does. One thing that is different with regression is that regression allows us to make predictions. So if we have a predictor variable and an outcome variable, the predictor variable we normally refer to that as x and the outcome variable we normally refer to that as our y. And we hypothesize that x can predict y, one of the purposes of regression is to allow us to estimate the value of y given the value of x. So if we know what the value of x is, we can predict the value of y. If perceived transformational leadership and motivation of employees do have some kind of a relationship, then technically regression provides us information in terms of what that equation is and that equation, that linear equation, will allow us to predict the value of um, motivation, the level of motivation of employees given the perceived transformational leadership. This is a very familiar topic that we have had in algebra. Um, particularly in algebra, we've talked about um, linear equations. So linear equations are mathematical uh, expression of a line. Um, why do we give so much importance with a line? Um, a line such as this, a line such as this. Why are lines important in regression? Because line represents relationships or at least represents the quality of relationships between variables. Even in our lesson in correlation, lines have been mentioned. Let's say, for example, uh, we have two axes representing two variables. And uh, when we plot our data set using these two variables on the x and the, and the y axis, uh, we can plot several points 
So these are points. It's kind of hard to draw points. And the shape by which these points are scattered on this plane can be, can be, not all the time, but it can be represented by a line. So a line is used to model predictions and to sort of compare that with our current observations. And, and that's why it's called linear regression. And when we talk about linear equations, we have uh, talked about um, how a particular line can be expressed as an equation. And that equation comes in a variety of uh, versions. But in our case, we'd stick with this equation. So Y apostrophe, meaning to say the predicted uh, value of y is equal to bx. So b being the regression coefficient. I talked about the regression coefficient a while ago. So b particularly is the unstandardized regression coefficient plus a. Uh, and a is, if you remember your linear equation, a is the value of y when x is zero. Technically, in linear regression, we can also produce equations that are similar to these. Uh, and if we have an equation similar to these, technically linear regression will allow us to do exactly what linear equations affords us to do. And that is to make an estimate um, expressed in values of the outcome variable if we know the value of x. However, Specifically in our discipline, psychology, we do not normally use this particular function of regression. If we would use that, uh, for example, this is perceived transformational leadership and this is motivation. If we found that there is a relationship between the two, a predictive one, and therefore we're able to derive an equation representing the linear relationship between the two, then we can make statements such as for every one unit change in transformational leadership, there will be a so-and-so change in Y. Technically, we can, we can say that. However, as what we have pointed out, um, we don't really do that in the discipline of psychology because it does not make sense no? because our measures are somewhat arbitrary and there are no universal measures of our constructs no, such as perceived transformational leadership or motivation, employee motivation. And they're very abstract. So it, it does not make sense to assign a specific numerical value to motivation. No, when we talk about motivation, we don't do that. We don't do that in, you know, casual conversations among colleagues who are also psychologists or, you know, among um, our friends who are also psychology major. If we're talking about economics, then you'd expect that. But for other social sciences, probably not. So here is an example of two variables that have a relationship. Uh, so this is our x-axis. Uh, what are our two variables? Our two variables are merchandise sold. This seems to be a data set of, uh, coming from sales persons. And this is data containing um, how many sales persons do we have here? Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five. No. And these sales persons, five sales persons have different amounts of merchandise sold. Uh, the first salesperson, um, he's a rookie, didn't sell anything. The second one sold a thousand. The third one sold two thousand. The fourth one sold three thousand, and the uh, fifth one sold uh, four thousand. This is four thousand, not forty thousand. Sorry about that. Uh, and on the other hand, on the other axis, on the Y axis, we have salary. I guess it's logical to think that if you're a salesperson and your income is on sort of a commission basis, I think it's logical to think that um, the number of merchandise sold will have something to do with how much you sell. It's very much unlikely that these individuals would earn the same amount of money given that each one of them brought in different amounts of money to the company. So it is logical that uh, the number of merchandise sold uh, will have 
some kind of a positive relationship with salary wherein the more you sell, the higher you earn. And this is what the previous slide refers to as a perfect relationship. One indicator of a perfect relationship is when you see that all of your observations, so these are observations, right? These are salespersons, these are individuals. So this is a salesperson, this salesperson sold 4,000 and because he sold 4,000, he earned around 2,100. This is another salesperson. This salesperson sold around 3,000 worth of uh, products and he earned 1,700. I am guesstimating, but I'm fairly sure that I'm accurate on my guesstimates. And this person sold nothing at all. So there. Uh, and, and this is a perfect relationship because all of our data points fall exactly on a straight line. And that means to say that on the basis of this information, I can sort of make an extended prediction. Uh, and the line would continue that way. In such a way that if there is a salesperson who sold this much, 2,400, the line tells us or allows us to predict that his salary will be around this much. So using these available observations, we can make predictions. And that is the thing about a line. A line is composed of several points. So I can create um, other possibilities here. Now we find another person here, another person here, another person here. This line will allow us to predict what salary they would have based on their merchandise sold. But of course, I'm not literally saying that we would have sort of this kind of graph and every time somebody comes in and says, hi boss, this is how much I sold and then we will consult this. Ah, okay, so you sold this much, uh, then you will earn this much. What we do when we have information about pairs of scores, such as what we have here, is that we can compute for an equation. So this line has a certain equation. This line is represented by a certain equation. And that equation, as what we have pointed out, is the equation of a line is the predicted value of y equals bx plus a. So that is the equation of any line, any straight line for that matter. So what is the equation of this particular line? Well, let's try to derive the equation of this line. Let's begin with A. What is A in a linear equation? Is 500. Uh, and why is it 500? Because when X is zero, so when the, the merchandise sold is zero, the question is how much is our salary, our Y? 500. And thus, a is 500 because A represents the value of Y, salary, when X is zero. Um, y and X are variables, meaning to say they can be any value. What we are identifying are, are A and B. No. So A is also known as the intercept. Uh, and I'm telling you this because in the regression result, you will encounter this term, no? the intercept. Now, what about B? Uh, or in some equations, it's also referred to as M, but for consistency, let's just refer to it as B. So B is actually what I was referring to a while ago. B is your unstandardized regression coefficient. It also goes by the name of slope. Now, how do we compute for slope? What is our, when you were in high school, what was the mnemonic to compute for slope? All right, very good. Rise over run. Uh -huh. And how do we exactly compute for rise over run? So what we do is we identify any two points here uh, that we have in our observations. So let's say, for example, this point and this point. Both of these 
points have um, values for Y, which is salary, and values for X, which is merchandise sold. We have it for this point, and we have it for this point. So the rise that is being referred to here is it's from here to here. So the distance between this and that, so that is our rise. And what are we referring to here? We are referring to values in our uh, y-axis. So specifically, uh, the values here are for this, uh, this is 1,700 and this is 1,300. Now what about run? Run is from this point to that point, which is the distance between the merchandise sold of this particular individual and the merchandise sold of this particular individual. And what are these values? What are the values being referred to here? 3,000 and 2,000. Okay. So when we talk about rise, that is the distance between our Y points. The distance from 1, 3 to 1, 7. So how do we derive that? Simply, we subtract 1,300 from 1,700. So that is 400. And what about the run? That is the distance between our two x points. And what are our x's? 3,000 and 2,000. So, of course, we have to subtract the smaller one from the larger one. So, 2,000 or 3,000 rather minus 2,000. Our run is 1,000. Therefore, our rise over run is 400 divided by 1,000. And 400 divided by 1,000 is equal to 0.4. So plugging in our y-intercept and plugging in our slope, we now have a complete equation of this particular line. So what is the equation of this line? The predicted value of y is equal to 0.4x plus 500. And, and when we have this particular equation, and given that our relationship is perfect, we can now perfectly predict the y, salary. We can perf perfectly predict salary for as long as you plug in any value of x. And what is our x? x is our merchandise sold. So let's say, for example, we have a new employee and the new employee on his first month sold 1500 worth of merchandise. So the question is, how much should he earn? So that would be easy if we have this linear equation because all we have to do is to plug in our 1,500, which is a value of merchandise sold, to our x variable. x variable represents any number of merchandise sold. And with that, we can compute this would be, if we plug that in, this would be the predicted value of y is equal to 0.4 times, plugging in our value of x, 1,500 plus our y-intercept, 500 equals, all right, so let's compute. Um, what is 0.4 times 1,500 is 600 plus 500 600 plus 500 equals 1,100. So for as long as we provide the value of x, we can derive, we can perfectly predict in this case, the value of y. And even if we check the graph, it should check out. Where is 1,500? Right over here. Okay. And how much? So this is our new employee. He's right there. And how much does he earn based on our computation, 1,100? And it's right there, 1,100. All right. So that is, that is linear equation for us. And linear equation essentially is linear regression for perfect relationships.
So that all works out well when we talk about a perfect relationship. But one of the issues in our discipline is that we never have perfect relationships. When we talk about, especially in our discipline psychology, when we talk about our variables and how our variables such as perceived transformational leadership and motivation, these things are never perfectly related. And so we cannot necessarily compute for the equation of the lines that represent these supposed linear relationships using the traditional linear equation computations. So in imperfect relationships, the task is still the same, given that this is linear regression. By the way, since we're talking about linear regression, one important assumption when we use linear regression is that the relationship between the variables is linear. So this is one important assumption uh, that we have to keep in mind if we will be using linear regression. The assumption is that the relationship between the variables is linear. Meaning to say, if we sort of visualize, let's say for example this one, if we visualize the relationship between two variables, it is best represented or it can be best represented by a straight line because it might be that if we have let's say for example a scatter plot like this it might be that the configuration of the scatter plot is better represented by a curve line so that is not a linear relationship uh, when the increase in x initially leads to the increase in y but at some point of the increase in x it begins to plateau and further down the line as x increases y decreases so across the levels of x the relationships change initially it's positive and then it becomes flat and then it becomes negative then that is not a linear relationship that is a curvy linear relationship and when we are talking about linear regression, linear regression is used when we have a strong assumption that our variables are linearly related. And in most cases, they are. But it's just that sometimes if our relationship is curvy linear, then you can guarantee that using linear regression will not identify or will not be able to find evidence for that relationship because we are using the wrong kind of modeling because we are using a linear model for a curvy linear phenomenon. Anyway, that's just sort of a warning to us that if we are going to use linear regression, then we better be sure that the relationships of our variables at the conceptual level no, is no, really linear. We have a good reason to believe it. It really is linear. So the goal um, for linear regression, especially in the context of imperfect relationships, is still to model our data using a line. And specifically, this line is called, and this is very important, this line is called the least squares regression line. And there, that is the equation of the least squares regression line. So how do we derive the least squares regression line? Let me illustrate it to you visually first. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that if we have here a data set, so this data set contains measures of two variables. One is IQ and the other one is grade point average. And we know that IQ, it's logical to think that IQ can predict our grade point average. And if we plot all of these data set, we have a number of students here and these students, we have accounted for their IQ and we have accounted for their GPA. And when we plot data of these particular students, we have, we have this plot. So the question is, it looks linear, right? Uh, it, it seems that as uh, IQ increases, um, GPA increases, it seems that when we draw a straight line, it seems that it's the best way to represent this particular data set. Certainly, if we draw a sort of a parabolic curve, that, that wouldn't make sense. No? This does not model 
our observations well. We can sort of argue that still the best way to model this is via a straight line. So we have at least no visual confirmation that this is a linear relationship. So our goal is still to identify what line best represents this. Because in our previous example, this one, the line that best represents the data set, one, two, three, four, five, um, the line fits perfectly um, in the data set because we have a perfect relationship. But in the, our new scenario, we don't have a perfect relationship between IQ and GPA. And so while we can still represent this via a straight line, it's not sort of a perfect fit between predictions and what we are observing. Right? And our goal is to identify a certain line, which could be this line or that line or this line or this line. We don't know yet. And that line that we're looking for, supposedly the best line is what we call as the least squares regression line. And why is it the least squares regression line? Because the line is meant for prediction. We know that there will be errors in prediction, but this is the line that will result to the least amount of errors, a line that minimizes the errors in prediction. If you take a look at this, if I draw a line here, for sure there will be errors in prediction. My prediction, for example, is that if your IQ is somewhere here, the line predicts that your GPA is somewhere here. But what's not happening? Based on the observation, this person who has this IQ actually has a GPA of this much. So there is a difference. Based on the line, if your IQ is here, your GPA should be here. But our observation is that this individual who has this IQ actually has this particular GPA. So there are errors in prediction. And what we want is a line that results to the least amount of error. If this is the line that we're talking about, then this has lots of errors into it, right? Because the, the distance of these points from the prediction line, that's the amount of error. So that's a very big error, huge error, huge error, as opposed to this one, minimal, minimal, minimal error, minimal error. So what we're looking for is a line that results to the least amount of distance between an observation, which is this one, and a prediction, which is that one. So we're looking for a line that minimizes the distance between those two. And the way we do that is by computing as well. So there is a formula uh, that allows us to compute the slope in this case for our regression equation, our y-intercept. And ultimately, I will not talk about the mathematics behind it. When we compute for linear regression, it should provide us with this equation. So we should arrive at this equation. So this equation has the components of a typical linear equation. We have here the predicted value of y is equals to, this is the slope, this is our variable x, and this is our y-intercept. And this, of course, given that it's a linear equation, translates into a visualization of a line. Right? So the question is, which line is this? No. And this, granting that we have arrived at this particular equation, this is our least squares regression line. So technically, arriving at well, of course, we will do this using software. But mathematically, of course, there is an equation to arrive at the equation of the line that best represents the imperfect data, the line that will result to the least amount of error in prediction, the line which we refer to as the least squares regression line. Now, before I continue, let's clarify, what do we exactly mean by least squares regression line? 
what is being referred to when we say, well, least, I understand what least is, pero ano yung squares? For example, we ran our computations using this particular data set. We arrived at an equation. We use that equation to plot certain points. And when we have plotted certain points, for example, when we used our linear equation, we identified two points, one being, for example, we've identified the intercept. So that is the first point. Point. And then using the equation, we've identified another point because we have plugged in an x. And by plugging in an x, we have identified a y value. And for as long as we have two points, then we can draw a straight line. And let's say, for example, that this is the line that we have drawn. First of all, clearly, the red line is a better modeling of the data set versus the black line. Let's say that this is the least squares regression line. Why is it called like so? Um, what do we know about the least squares regression line? It is the line that results to the least amount of error in prediction. So let's try to clarify what this particularly means. If you try to look at this, what is our input initially? What is our predictor? Our predictor is IQ. So this is our predictor. Meaning to say, if I call on any level of IQ, using the least squares regression line, we can predict the grade point average. So if I say IQ of 120, the least squares regression line would tell us that the grade point average should be here. If I call on IQ 130, the least squares regression line will tell us that the GPA should be here. Now, if we consider certain specific observations, so let's say, for example, this one, this person, this is the observed data. And what do we observe? We observe that this particular person has an IQ of about, I'm guesstimating here, around 125. If you have an IQ of 125, the prediction is that if we are using the line, your grade point average should be this one. But the observed is telling us otherwise. The observed is telling us that the grade point average is around here. Let me erase the other lines to avoid confusion. So while this is our observed, observed Y, this is our predicted, predicted Y. So this is our observed Y and this is our predicted Y. With an IQ of around 125, we predict that the grade point average would be here, judging from the least squares regression line. That is the predicted value of Y. So that is a little over 2. But for this case, the grade point average of this specific case, the observed y is actually below 2. So there is a discrepancy between the observed and the predicted. There is that distance. Okay. And this distance between the observed y here and the predicted y here is what we call as error. By the way, the predicted y the notation of the predicted y specifically is that, y apostrophe. The observed y is simply y. The predicted y is y apostrophe. And the difference between y apostrophe and the regular y, which is our observed y value, our observed GPA, that difference is termed as an error. And so if you backtrack a couple of slides, you can see that particular equation here, y minus y apostrophe. Um, and that is exactly, exactly this, the observed minus the predicted. So what was that again? Error is equal to y minus y apostrophe. So error is the difference between the observed y and the predicted y. So there you have it. All right. So we're just talking about one case here, but we have multiple cases in here. So let me clear this first. 
So we're only talking about one error here. But we have multiple comparisons of observed and predictions here. Observed, predicted. Observed, predicted. Observed, predicted. Observed, predicted. And in all cases, the observed is not the same as the prediction. So therefore, there is an error, an error, error, error. So all of those distances between the observed and the predicted are called errors. And if you follow this particular equation in computing for error, you would find that some errors are positive, such as these errors. These will be positive if we compute these errors. And some errors will be negative. These errors will be negative when the observed is below the prediction line. Now, how do we know that this is really the least squares regression line? Again, the definition says it is the least squares regression line if the amount of error that we're seeing here is the least. And getting an overall measure of the amount of error is a simple case of summation. So you simply add all of the errors. But we have a problem here. What happens when we add all of these errors? Some of the errors being negative, some of the errors being positive. What would happen if we add all of these error values, some of which are negative, some of which are positive? What will be our result when we add all of these? Zero. And that is a problem because if we say that the sum of all of the errors in prediction is zero, that should mean to say that, the, that all of the observed data points are exactly the same as the predicted data points. No, there is no difference. There is no error no, because what we computed for is zero. Now, the question is how do we avoid the zero? Because clearly there are errors and if we sum the errors it's zero that doesn't make sense the errors should not be zero so our original computation for error y minus the uh, observed value of y minus the predicted value of y they should be squared and so what we are what we should sum is not the errors what we should sum is we should sum the squared errors. Sum of squared errors. And that's why it's called the least squares regression line. The squares here refers to this one, the squared errors. So what we want is that when we sum all of the squared errors, we want the line that produces the least amount of squared errors. And that's why it's called the least squares regression line. So squares, we need to say the, those are the squared values of these errors. That when summed up, this should be at a minimum relative to other possible regression lines. Okay. And that's why it's called the least squares regression line. All right. So that's it. I hope that you uh, understood a bit about linear regression.